Diary of a Nobody by George and Whedon Grossmith Adapted by Andrew Lynch Episode 2 The Trials, Tribulations and Triumphs of my dear son Lupin and my beloved husband Charles Pooter Dear Diary Clouds, clouds and more clouds Our son Lupin is in turmoil His engagement to Daisy Mutler is broken off Good morning, father, mother. Good morning. How are you, my dear? Oh, I'm just taking one day at a time. Our only child is clearly suffering from a broken heart. His father, in an attempt to take Lupin's mind off his woes, suggested he follow his example and start a diary. I said nothing of my own poor efforts in this regard. How Lupin and I laughed when Charles told us that indeed his diary might one day be a source of wealth and fame. We don't mean to be rude, dear Charles, but truly I do not think your diary would sufficiently interest the public to be taken up by a publisher. Samuel Pepys had his published and it was just about ordinary life. <laughs> If yours had been written on larger paper, Gov, we might get a fair price from the butter man for it. <laughs> that's very good, Lisa. Oh, that's boosted my mood enormously, Gov. <laughs> Did diary. After a sleepless night, disturbed by the passing of countless trains, quite unexpectedly over breakfast, dear Lupin startled us both quite out of our wits. I'm expecting Gowling and Cummings to drop in tomorrow evening for the game of dominoes. Perhaps you'd like to help amuse them? Oh, you had better pop them off, as I have asked Daisy and Frank Motler to come. After your engagement to Daisy has been broken off? Who said it is off? You have given us both to understand that... Well, never mind what I said. It is on again. I... I... My word. Dear diary, I am at a loss for words. Shall I serve breakfast now? Yes, please, Sarah. We'll be entertaining guests tomorrow evening, Sarah. Please turn over the cold leg of mutton, dress it with a, a little parsley... And no one will know it has been cut. Yes, Mrs. Pooter. I'd better inspect the mutton for peace of mind. Come, Sarah. Yes, Mrs. Pooter. Lupin, you don't have any personal objection to either Gavin or Cummings being here, do you? Not at all, Gov. Very good. They are my dearest friends, and a young man can learn from all elders, not just his father. I've no objection, because I hardly regard them except to think Cummings looks rather an ass, but that is partly due to his patronising the three-shilling, one-price hat company and wearing a reach-me-down frock coat. As for that perpetual brown velveteen jacket of Gowing's, he resembles an itinerant photographer. It is not the coat that makes the gentleman know, and it was not much of a gentleman who made their coats. Dear Charles was still recovering from the shock of Lupin's announcement when another surprise was sprung upon him by his beloved Mr Perkup. Mr Perkup wants to see you before you start your dinner. Of course. Wouldn't like to be in your shoes. Yes? Is Pooter... Mr. Perkop? Enter. Take a seat, Mr. Pooter. I shall not be a moment. No, thank you, sir. I'll, I'll stand. I hope there is nothing wrong, sir. Oh, dear, no. Well, quite the reverse. I hope. <clears throat> Mr Buckling is going to retire and there will be some slight changes in the office. You have been with us for nearly 21 years and, in consequence of your conduct during that period, we intend making a special promotion in your favour. We have not quite decided how you will be placed, but in any case there will be a 
considerable increase in your salary, which it is quite unnecessary for me to say you fully deserve. Thank you, Mr. Perkup. Thank you. Thank you. A bottle of Jackson Frères, as requested from the grocers, sir. Thank you, sir. What champagne tastes like, sir? Difficult to describe, really. That'll be all, sir. Oh. <laughs> this will definitely be a red letter day for my diary. After being used to getting a ten pound rise annually, I thought it might be fifteen pounds or twenty pounds, but one hundred pounds surpasses all belief. Oh, you deserve it, dear. <laughs> Thank you, darling Carrie. I just think Mr. Perkup thinks so too. Oh, champagne gov. Am I on to something here? This is to celebrate some good news I've received today. Ah, oh, hooray, Gov. And I have some good news also. A double event, eh? I'll get a glass. My boy, as a result of 21 years industry, I have been rewarded with promotion to senior clerk and a rise in salary of £100. <laughs> Three cheers for you, Gov. <laughs> hip, hip. <laughs> now my good news. Having been in the firm of Job Clean and Stock and Share Brokers a few weeks, my governor allotted me five pounds worth of shares in a really good thing. The result is today I have made two hundred pounds. What? <laughs> Lupin, you are joking. No, Gov. It's the good old truth. And you've made two hundred pounds. Yes, I have. Let's have another bottle. We don't have another bottle. But then we soon will have. Sarah. I trust you will invest and save this windfall wisely. I certainly intend to, but your wisely and mine may be two different wisely. No extravagances, please, Lupin. Oh, don't worry, mother. Ah, Sarah, will you please pop along to the grocer's and buy a bottle, nay, two bottles of Jackson <sighs> Frères? Yes, sir. Are you justified in this extravagance brought about by reckless speculation? Look here, Gov. Excuse me for saying so, but you're a bit out of date. It does not pay nowadays fiddling about over small things. <laughs> fiddling about over small things? I don't mean anything personal, Governor. But my boss says if I take his tip and stick to big things, I can make big money. I find the very idea of speculation most horrifying. Oh, I answered why, Lupin. I agree. Yeah. But it is not speculation. It's a dead cert. Oh. I've made £200 in one day. What's a few pounds on champagne? My dear Gov, I promise you faithfully that I will never speculate with what I have not got. Mm. Ah, Sarah, well done. Get yourself a glass and join in our celebrations. <laughs> Dear Diary, Charles has decided to have one of his periodic, encouraging chats with Sarah. It rarely ends well. So is it because I accepted a glass of champagne from Master Lupin? Of course not, sir. It's simply the careless habit of shaking the tablecloth after removing dishes and crockery. It causes all the crumbs to fall on the carpet, eventually to be trodden in. Oh, you're always complaining, sir. Indeed, I am not. The soap? Yes, I did speak to you last week about walking all over the drawing room carpet with a piece of yellow soap on the heel of your boot. And you're always grumbling about your breakfast. No. Last week, it was the sausages. It was not a complaint. I merely questioned your cooking methods. You even blamed me for burning your tongue. I merely pointed out that the Worcester sauce bottle should not be shaken as violently as you tend to do it. It excites the oriental spices unnecessarily. <laughs> I shall never accept another glass of champagne for Master Lupin ever again. <laughs> What's the matter with her? Hello, Cummings. Lupin, with an act of thoughtless kindness, has skewed temporarily the very basic fabric of our domestic harmony. Sorry I asked. Well, have I not been missed? It being three weeks since we last met. Time does fly. Well, Cummings, how are you? I've been on my back for a couple of weeks, 
At one time, my doctor nearly gave me up, yet not a soul has come near me. No one has even taken the trouble to inquire whether I was alive or dead. The only company I've had was my wife, the doctor, and the landlady. I wonder you did not see it in the paper. I know it was mentioned in the bicycle news. I only see the bicycle news when you bring it round, and as you haven't... Sorry to enter unannounced, but Sarah's blabbing in the hall and can't speak. Hello, Cummings. Have you seen a ghost? You look like Irving in Macbeth. Ha! Ow! Gently going. The poor fellow has been very ill. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose you care. Hello, you three. Just popped in to change. This gentleman is Mr. Murray Posh. Very pleased to meet you. By the way, if you chaps still have misgivings about investing £20 on my advice in parachica chlorate, let Mr. Murray Posh reassure you with the faith he has in yeah. me. Lupin! Lupin! Murray Posh, eh? Any relation to Posh's three shilling hats? Well, I... Really going? You've not even been introduced. Going, Mr Posh, and this is Cummings. I'm very pleased to meet you, sir. Very pleased to meet you, too. Lupin's father, Pooter. That do, old fussball? I'm very pleased to meet you, Mr Posh. May I repeat my question about the hats now, Pooter? No need, Mr Going. I am of the family you refer to, but I take little active part in the business. Oh. Oh. And might I ask the business of... Had a cheek of chlorates. Oh, yeah. As Lupin has inferred, I have invested heavily on his advice, and I have utter faith in him. Oh, <laughs> oh, evening, Carrie. Oh, we have a sudden influx of company. Caddy, my dear, may I introduce Mr. Murray Posh of the Hat family? The rest you know. I enjoy company and entertaining in Brickfield Terrace when I know who to expect and have sufficient notice to prepare, but at times my home quite resembles a gentleman's club. What with Gowing and Cummings popping in unannounced and Lupin bringing friends around without prior warning, the latest being a Mr Murray Posh. I'm told of the Three Shilling Hat Company. He's a large young man who steered a conversation around to Miss Daisy Mutler on several occasions, which I found odd. I mentioned this fact to Charles, but all he could talk about was parachique chlorates, which I also found strange. Lupin... A delicate subject. What's that, Gov? The birds and the bees? Please! Your mother's expressing some anxiety about the way Mr Murray Posh of the Three Shilling Hat Company spoke of Miss Daisy Muttler, your fiancé, in a rather familiar way. I don't understand what she could be worried about. That Mr Posh may cut you out. <laughs> Gov! A man who is jealous has no respect for himself. A man who would be jealous of an elephant like Murray Posh could only have contempt for himself. My word. William Lupin. Lupin was totally dismissive of any suggestion that Mr Murray Posh was a threat to his relationship with Miss Daisy Muttler. My mind is at rest, Charles. I've watched you brush your hair over many years. Have you noticed that as it thins, it takes you increasingly longer? Hmm. Oh, can only deduce that my hair brush is becoming worn out, and a suitable replacement may make an ideal present when the occasion arises. Oh, I, I, I fear it isn't the brush that's wearing thin. Well, you don't mean... No, nonsense. From where I'm standing. No. I may be greying around the temples, which you must admit makes me look more distinguished, but that's the thinning. No, to borrow my hand mirror. Well. I think it's a trick of the light. I'll stand nearer. There, see? I don't think... If I twist... Oh, no! It's not such a calamity, dear. Purchase another tomorrow on my way home from work. A few shillings. Oh, it isn't the price, Charles. A broken mirror will bring us terrible luck. Oh, nonsense, Caddy. You are the most sensible and practical of people, yet you can be absurdly superstitious. I know Mrs James of Sutton is your oldest and dearest friend, but I blame her for setting up our example. Salt spill, ladders avoided, etc, etc. Oh, she is gifted in spiritualism, Charles, and her experiences should not be trivialised. I've never commented before. But I now have to say, I find all a mumbo-jumbo absolute rot. No, Charles. Mark my words. Some 
misfortune is about to happen. Governor, you know those parachica chlorates I advised you to invest £20 in? Yes, Lupin. They're all right, I trust. Well, no. To the surprise of everybody, they've utterly collapsed. Oh, what did I tell you? The broken mirror. However, you are specially fortunate. I received an early tip, sold yours immediately, and was fortunate to get £2 for them. So you get something after all. (laughs) Good. A profit of two pounds is a good percentage for such a short time. Now you don't understand. I sold your twenty pound shares for two pounds, and you therefore lose eighteen pounds on the transaction. <sighs> whereby Cummings and Gowing will lose the whole of us. The broken mirror. I, of course it wasn't, Carrie. But parachuca chlorates were supposed to be so safe. I'm very sorry, and it wouldn't have happened if the boss, Job Cleanins, had been in town. Between ourselves. You must not be surprised if something goes wrong at our office. Job Cleanins has not been seen in the last few days, and it strikes me several people do want to see him very particularly. Oh, thank goodness I didn't mention it to Mr Perkup. It would have blighted your chances forever. The chances of what? My dream. Mr Perkup employing you. Your dream? Our dream, Lupin. Every parent's dream. But if Daisy and I are going to... Can I come in? I'm sorry, it has to be unannounced by Sarah. Again? I must have a word with that girl. Oh, please don't scold on my account. I don't want to think of me also as an old fusspot. Is that remark directed at me, going? Of course it is. Hello, Lupin. I say those parachica chlorates have got an awful smash. You're a nice one. How much you lose? Oh, nothing. What? Now, there was some informality in my application. I forgot to enclose the cheque or something and didn't get any. Ah, good for you, boy. <laughs> you, Poodle? The gov loses £18. <laughs> I understood you were in it too, or nothing would have induced me to speculate, Lupin. Well, it can't be helped. You must go double on the next tip. That will be the last thing I do. Apologies, going. Oh, I lose nothing, fortunately. What? Why not? From what I heard, I did not quite believe in them, so I persuaded Cummings to take my £15 worth, as he had more faith than I had. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, good for you and the last poor Cummings. He'll lose £35. (laughs) Best avoided at the moment, then, I think. (laughs) Mr Cummings is at the door, sir. What? Do show him in, please. No, 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 wait! Um, the window. Ah. Right! Shh, shh, right, right, right behind you, Lupin, old boy. Lupin, Lupin, I, I said big... I, Gowie, this behaviour is intolerable. No! Show Cummings in, please, sir. Run it round to Lockwood's for some whiskey. Yes, Mr Pooter. to your liking this morning, sir? Yes. Thank you, Sarah. Ah, the newspaper. The day starts here. Charles, read the financial news. In good time, dear. There's an order to these things. Now, Charles, we have an interest. Oh, I see. Great failure of stock and share dealers. Mr Job Cleanans absconded. Perhaps it might be for Lupin's good. Yes, I never did think it's a suitable situation for him. It's all a very shocking, and I'll make a fresh approach to Mr Perkup under renewed circumstances. Good morning. Good morning, Lupin. I'm very sorry, but under the circumstances... What do you mean? What What have you had? Oh, no wonder you look so painfully distressed, my dear, dear boy. Hey, you couldn't possibly know. We have the news, my dear boy, and feel very sorry for you. But how? It's here. In black and white. Oh, oh, that, that. I don't care a button for Job Cleanings. I expected it. But I did not expect to receive this letter this morning. What letter, dear? My dear Lupin, I'm most terribly sorry to inform you that my sister Daisy intends to marry Mr Murray Posh on the 20th of the month. I do hope this will not affect our relationship and your membership of the Holloway Comedians. Yours, Frank. Muppler. What do you think about that? Muddy posh. Yes, the posh's three-shilling hat, chap. I knew it. The way he talked about Miss Daisy Mutler. Oh, my dear, dear boy. Why are you grinning? Oh, he's in shock. 
Well, that's highly likely, Mother, but I'm also consoled remembering Mr. Mori Posh has invested £600 in parachica chlorates. <laughs> Enter. Ah, Pooter. Without further ado, I'd like you to go home and collect your son for an interview. We have a vacancy that may suit him. Where is my darling wife? Oh, sir, whatever's the matter? What's happened? Can't, can't you speak? Neither, sir. Is there anything I can do, sir? No, just go. You mustn't see your master like this. No. Very good, sir. <laughs> Charles, my dear husband, what has caused you such distress? <laughs> no, Cammy, this is the happiest day of my life. Mr. Perkham wants to see Lupin with the view of finding him a position within the firm. <clears throat> oh, Charles. Dear diary, I share Charles's joy that Lupin has been taken on by Mr. Perkup. Though I fear his expectations of our son are too high. The truth is that he is still Lupin, but with a job. Spending too much time in music halls and living frivolously, always with an eye to the latest style of dress. So unlike his dear father in that regard. There. See? That is much better. Carrie? Mm, you do look nice, Lupin. What was wrong with my first choice? Too colourful and loud. A regular, downright respectable, funereal city firm junior clerk. That's me. Charles, have, have you a handkerchief or two? You, you may need more if your emotions take over. I shall be fine now, Gary. Your hat, Lupin? My hat. Awful. Lupin, wrench. Lupin, hat. Oh, oh, what oh, are oh, you oh, doing? You have ruined your hat. That was my full intention. Lupin, this is sheer madness. Charles, Charles. The man of the family of the manufacturer of the hat, Murray Posh, marries Miss Daisy Mutler this very day. Ah. Oh. Dear diary, I'm not insulted that Charles has declared today the happiest day of his life over the occasion of our blessed union of marriage. Charles is almost overcome with the situation of he and his boy in the same office, as they can go down and come home together by the same bus. Lupin? This is our first journey together on our way to the same office. And I just want to say how proud I am that you will be by my side working for our esteemed master. A brace of pooters in Perkop's game bag. You've reached a very important point in your life, and while I don't wish you less frivolity, I do request you balance it with a very serious attitude towards your work. Point taken. I shall continue the family tradition of faithful service to the firm and to the city. What exactly will I be doing at first? Filing and learning. This brings back such wonderful memories. When I first started on this great adventure, I was given some advice that I have never forgotten and now wish to pass it on to you. Who knows? In the future, you may find yourself passing it on to your boy. Are you ready to take it in? Yes, Gov. Let's hear it. Loop in, my boy. Filing without cross-reference is merely storage. You do understand that, don't you, Lupin? Yes, I do. And as well as remembering that, I'll always remember where I was when I heard such a profundity. Approaching the old witch. And at this part of the journey, I make sure I position myself in a spot where the lighting the bus is at its most favourable. There's nobody else on the bus. But a good habit is a good habit, whether the bus is crowded or not. We can't have a risk being boxed in or missing our stop. I'm so proud that we can share our journeys together, Lupin. Every day. Yes. Going to work and coming home together on the same omnibus as his son is Charles's dream. He fantasises that in the course of time a mature Lupin may read, digest and discuss the contents of Charles's newspaper and go on to take great interest in our little home and garden. But I fear Lupin does not share his father's joy in this. I was made happy today by a visit from my dear friend, Mrs. James of Sutton, always so full of good advice and news of what is the very latest thing. 
such a change from the company of Gowing and Cummings. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Sarah. Mr Cummings has arrived. Show him in, please, Sarah. Oh, hello, Charles. Oh, dear. Uh-huh. Do you mind how you go now, Mr Cummings? Ah, uh, no oh. word, Cummings. Why the walking stick? I suffered a terrible accident. On your bicycle? Oh. No, but it was reported in Bicycle News. Oh, hello. I believe I've missed Mrs James of Sutton. Oh, only by a few minutes, dear. Uh, why are you hobbling, Cummings? I'm about to explain. Please do. I have been on my back for a week after trying to shut the bedroom door. In pulling the door hard, the handle came off and I fell backwards downstairs. <laughs> no, pain. <Lupin>. Do excuse me. <laughs> well... I think it's very poor for a chap to make fun of a man nearly breaking his back. Oh, no, my dear Cummings, Lupin has only left hurriedly to open the door to a friend he expected. Oh, really? This is the second time I've been laid up with no one sent to inquire, even though on both occasions my situation was mentioned in the bicycle news. And by way of apology, will you please stay for a little light supper? Oh, thank you, Pooter. Very kind. Yes, I will. Shall I inform Sarah, or will you carry? Carry? Hmm. Carrie, what are you doing to your fingernails? Oh, sorry, dear. I'm manicuring. It's all the fashion now. Oh, I suppose Mrs James introduced that into your head? Yes, and I don't know what i do without her keeping me up to date. I find it quite easy not to be kept up to date. Whenever Mrs James visits, she introduces you to some new fandangled rubbish. Nonsense, Charles. I demand an example. Freely given. Was it not Mrs James of Sutton who put you up to writing on dark slate-coloured paper with white ink? Oh. I mean, what nonsense! It's not fish, is it, Pooter? I had that for lunch. It's Monday, and as a consequence, you will dine with us on mutton and vegetables. Look who I found on the doorstep. Hello, going? Mutton and veg, eh? Shall I start to clear away now, Mrs Pooter? Uh, yes, please, Sarah. You won't find much, if anything, left on the plates. The portions were quite small, being for so many. Oh, please don't apologise, Mrs Pooter, and on my behalf at least. I ate earlier in my lodgings and found my portion quite sufficient. Oh, well, it was good of you to join us to be sociable, Mr Gowing. Is anyone up for a game of dominoes? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> l- later, Lupin. <sighs> Although I'm surprised you have the energy for it after such a full and rewarding day. The subject of which I've still yet to enlighten your mother. I hold my patience for as long as it takes, dear. Play dominoes if it pleases you. No, well, we will. But the most curious thing has just happened. What's that? This is remarkable, but I've suddenly remembered an extraordinary dream I had. I must tell you about it. Must you, Charles? There is nothing so completely uninteresting as other people's dreams. Um, hear, hear. Yeah, but when the dreams are interesting... What do you say, Cummings? I agree with Gowing. Well, I am astounded. And promise I will never tell you or anybody else a dream of mine the longest day I live. Here, here, let's play dominoes. I shall, I shall, however, record my dreams in my diary to be contemplated by myself and future readership. You keep a diary, Pooter. The gov's going to find a publisher and make us all very well off. (laughs) (laughs) Is that true, Pooter? (laughs) Let us play dominoes. (laughs) Ah, morning, sir. Morning, sir. Scrambled eggs. Is it Thursday? Yes, sir. Then it's scrambled eggs. Yes, sir. You have a letter? Thank you, sir. Mrs Pooter is in the parlour. As I soon will be. Morning, Charles. Morning, Carrie. We have a letter from... My word. Yes, Charles? Mr Franching of Peckham asking us to dine with him tonight at seven o'clock to meet Mr Hardfur Huttle, a very clever writer for the American papers. Tonight? That's very short notice in Peckham. Why must people live so far away? Franching apologises for the short notice, but says he has, a, at the last moment, been disappointed by two of his guests and regarding us as old friends mm-hmm. who would not mind filling up the gap. Oh, 
I'm not sure if we're the right people to accommodate Mr. Franching. We certainly can't afford to offend him. Franching's very well off and influential. We're sure to get a good dinner and a good glass of champagne. Which never agrees with you. And so we went all the way to Peckham on the omnibus to dine with Mr. Hardfur Huttle, a very opinionated American gentleman. The champagne was plentiful, and it never agrees with Charles. <laughs> Do you know, happy medium are two words which mean miserable mediocrity. <gasps> Uh, may I go on and risk alienating our hostess with my views? Please do, Mr. Huttle. My sister relishes provocative conversation. I find your views and conversation fascinating, Mr. Huttle, but wouldn't hesitate to disagree if I think fit. Mm, which would only stimulate our lively debate. <laughs> well, I will make more of my case against the happy medium. We're privileged to be here, Cavi. I agree, Charles. I say... Go first class or third. Marry a duchess or her kitchen maid. The happy medium means respectability. And respectability means insipidness. Does it not, Mr. Pooter? Well, I fear in, in such esteemed company, I, I, I'm happy to listen without comment. Mm. The happy medium is nothing more or less than a vulgar half-measure. A man who loves champagne and finding a glass too little fears to face a whole bottle and settles for an imperial pint will never build a Brooklyn Bridge or an Eiffel Tower. No, he is half-hearted. He is a half-measure, in fact, a happy medium, and will spend the rest of his days in a suburban villa with a stucco column portico resembling a four-post bedstead. The champagne is top class. <laughs> They're still speaking. Yeah, that sort of thing belongs to a soft man with a soft beard with a soft head. With a made tie that hooks on. You have such a tie, Charles. Shh. He's speaking generally. Pass the champagne. There will be no lobster to blame tomorrow, Charles. What we want in America is your homes. Oh, we live on wheels. Your simple, quiet life and home, Mr. Franching, is charming. There's no display, no pretension. You make no difference in your dinner, I dare say, when you sit down by yourself as when you invite us. Oh. <laughs> Just a small dinner with a few good friends who appreciate intelligent conversation and good company. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no mediocre, happy, medium, orthodox people here. Hey, Pooter! Mr. Huttle, I've enjoyed your company and a, a little while ago declined to comment when asked, but now I feel a, a small response is called for. Charles, you are emboldened by the champagne. Uh, no. <laughs> Mr. Huttle, my wife, Carrie, and I feel privileged to have been invited here this evening by Mr. Franching, and it, it's been a great pleasure to have met you and listened to your views. Now... Your ideas are original and sometimes wonderful, but to me they seem so dangerous. They may make men extremely rich or extremely poor. They may indeed make or break men. But I always feel people are happier who live a simple, unsophisticated life. I believe I am happy because I'm not ambitious or a trailblazer. And in defence of mediocrity, happy medium and orthodoxy... May I say, these are the qualities of men that follow in the wake of people like Columbus and Stevenson, who made a practical success out of the grandiose ideas. I agree, without these great men there might neither have been the discovery of America nor the steam engine, but it was the ordinary man who sailed the ships and cast the iron. The orthodox who stick to the plans, file the papers and balance the accounts. Without the little man... Content with the happy medium, society would crumble. Bravo, Pooter! <laughs> what a sterling defence of the mundane. Your health, sir. More champagne, Pooter. Thank you, Mr. Franching. Oh, dearie, dearie me. I write this diary entry with a heavy heart. The day which dawned after our dinner with Mr. Hardfur Huttle must surely be one of our darkest. 
Champagne never agrees with Charles, and so of course he was far too poorly to go into the office next morning. Lupin went alone, and it is Charles's belief that had Charles been present, he would have averted a disastrous series of events. To be brief, one of Mister Perkup's most valued customers, a Mister Crobelin, arrived in the office in a rage over some matter. Lupin boldly suggested he take his custom elsewhere. In fact, to Gilderson Sons and Company. My dear son, Lupin clearly believed it the best course of action at the time. But Charles has accused Lupin of an act of treachery to Mister Perkup, and has written a grovelling letter on the firm's behalf to Mister Crobelin. Though in my heart, I fear it will do no good. Charles has been waiting three fretful days now for a reply. Well, Gov, what do you think? Lupin, I just don't know. I'm hoping the delay is because Mr. Crowbillen is giving my letter a great deal of thought. Oh, not that! My new hat, Lupin. Do you really think it's appropriate, under the circumstances, to be buying a new hat and casually asking my opinion on I it? I didn't buy it. It was a present. I met an old friend that I did not quite think of as a friend at the time, but as he wisely said, <laughs> all is fur in love and war. Lupin, my head is spinning with recent events and your treachery regarding Mister Perkup. Consequently, I am waiting with great trepidation for the post. What are you talking about, my friend? A jolly, good, all-round sort of fellow, a very different stamp from that inflated fool of a Perkup. Hush, Lupin. Do not play at insult to injury. What do you mean by injury? I repeat, I have done no injury. Crowbillin is simply tired of a stagnant firm and made the change on his own account. I simply recommended the new firm as a matter of good business. The friend who gave me the hat, by the way, was Mr. Murray Posh, with whom I'm having lunch in the city. Goodbye, Gov. It will all work out for the best. You'll see. <sighs> Off went Lupin in that very handsome hat. And no sooner had he gone than the dreaded letter arrived. Charles seemed rooted to the spot. Charles, who's just waiting for the post, and now it is here. You just hold the letters in your hand. What's the matter? I am once again shocked, rigid by the antics of our son, who is out lunching in the city, and seems in good spirits, sporting a new hat, courtesy of Mister Murray Posh, now husband of Miss Daisy Mutler.、Mm, that's a turn up. As are these. Two letters, Crowbillen Hall. The contents of this could determine our, the firm's, and Mister Perkup's future. Any other? To Lupin, from Gilterson Sons and Company Limited, the firm Lupin so freely recommended. Sarah, please go after Master Lupin and tell him he has a letter that could be of some importance. Yes, sir. My fingers tremble. You've done your best to retrieve the situation, Charles, having written a sixteen-page letter. And he has replied in less than six lines. Saying what? Sir, I totally disagree with you. Your son, in the course of five minutes' conversation, displayed more intelligence than your firm has done in the last five years.、Mm -hmm. Yours faithfully, Gilbert E. Gillam O. Crowbillen.、Uh, you have a, a letter, Lupin. Thank you. <coughs> In gratitude for recommending Mr. Crowbillen into our business, please find enclosed the token of our gratitude. <laughs> How about that, girl? A cheque for twenty-five pounds from <laughs> Gilterson Sons and Company Limited. Oh, and it goes on to say that they'd like to see me. Why, Lupin? With a view to possibly finding me a position. Oh well, I suppose I have to find somewhere to earn a living. Must be off again. Well, Lupin may have done himself a lot of good. But at whose expense? Imagine Mr. Perkup discovering that Lupin, my son, has received a recommendation bonus. From our great rivals, what am I to do? Charles was beside himself with anxiety, though in my heart I felt that perhaps Lupin had done rather well for himself, 
and shown some of the boldness that Charles can sometimes lack. Good evening, Master Lupin. Good evening, Sarah. Three glasses, please. Four, if you'd like to join the celebrations. Best not. Thank you, sir. Last time made your father very finicky about crumbs on the carpet. The dove can act very strange following champagne. (laughs) Dear Diary, Champagne seems to be flowing very freely at Brickfield Terrace of late as we celebrate the undoubted successes of dear Lupin. Hello, Lupin. Are you celebrating? I can't think what. Uh, Take a look at that, Gov. What's a son and sons have engaged you at a salary of £200 a year with other advantages? Well done, Lupin! <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well done, my boy. As your fortune rises, mine fades. Dear diary, I'm always sad to see Charles down in the dumps when things aren't going well at the office, but I wish he would buck up and not complain about Mrs James of Sutton visiting. She's only staying a few days, and she is my dearest friend. Oh. Sarah, what is happening to the small round table from the drawing room? It's been taken into the parlour by Mrs James of Sutton. Why, Sarah? Don't know, sir. Maybe they're playing cards, sir. Oh. Oh, no. Thank you, Sarah. I forbid it. What, dear? Carrie, am I to assume correctly that you intend to practice table turning in this very parlour? Yes, dear, we are following instructions from the book. There is no death by Florence Marriott. Have you read it, Mr Pooter? I've always had the greatest contempt for such nonsense. And I put an end to it years ago when Carrie, at our old house, used to have seances every night with poor Mrs Fusters, who is now dead. I take it she has not been back in touch since, has she? Oh, Charles, how irreverent. And very unkind, Mr Pooter. If people were all as prejudiced as you, there would never have been the electric telegraph or the telephone. That is quite a different thing. In what way, Mr Pooter, pray? In what way? Science and engineering as opposed to fanciful, superstitious nonsense. Charles, Mrs James is our guest. Pardon me, Mrs James. I decline to discuss the matter any further and thoroughly disapprove of you going ahead with any spiritualist activities. Mr Cummings is here, sir, and Mrs Pooter. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, good evening, Pooter. Cummings, you've arrived in time to support my stance against the ludicrous practice of table-turning and spiritualism. Oh, I find it most interesting. I'm not much of a believer, but I'm willing to be convinced. Hello, Mrs Pooter Mm -hmm. and Mrs James. Oh, Cummings, you are, as ever, most welcome. We'd be most happy for you to join us, wouldn't we, Mrs James? Most definitely. Dear Mrs James of Sutton very generously agreed to allow Charles and Cummings to join us. And who should appear, just as we were about to begin, but their old friend Gowing, hoping, no doubt, for an invitation to supper. And he insisted on joining us too. What happened next was truly astonishing. Oh, great spirit, Lena. Charles Pooter has a question for you. And if the answer isn't satisfactory, the seance must be concluded. Charles, you agreed. I'm thinking of an old aunt of mine. Could you tell me her name? C. T. Cat! I was thinking of Aunt Maggie. Did she have a cat? No. And this just proves my... Charles. You've gone quite pale. Her second name was Catherine. Oh, 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 oh. Typical of the spirit, Lena, to make us work for the answer. <laughs> Behave, Lena. Ask her something else. No, the table's tipping towards you. Oh, 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 it's on the move. Oh. And you're doing the moving going. Any one of your tricks and I will turn up the gas. No, it isn't oh. me, on my word. Then I must believe you. Oh, the table is rising. Oh. It is you, Gary. It is it. No, no, I'll prove it by moving away. Look. Oh, oh God, it's moving. Oh, Charles, please turn the light up. Not yet. We don't want to chase her away. What's she spelling? N I P U L. Nipple. Oh, Charles, oh, ladies. I, no. <laughs> what can it mean? There's nothing with me. I'm detached from proceedings. Hush, going. Nipple? That's looping backwards! Oh, ah. my boy! And him away from home for a few days. Don't worry, Carrie. Is there more? D 
D-R-I-N-K. Drink. Ah, oh, that's more in my line. There's more. W A T E R. Water. Ah, oh, that's not in my line. Outside, if you like, but not inside. That hasn't finished yet. C A P T A I N. Captain Drinkwater, oh, is that oh, you? He was a very old friend of my father's who died some years ago. Oh, please ask him about Lupin. P O S H. Posh, Murray Posh. L U P I N. Lupin, yes, yes. What about him? B A Y S. Please. What could that mean? Well, ask it something else. Well, I'll come back in now. Yes, Gowing, ask a question, Mrs. James. Who is the foolish non believer amongst us? Bill P. O O T E R. It's you, old chap. You've really upset the spirit. Will he be punished? Going. B A L D Y. Baldy. Baldy, you are going thin on top, Charles. I'm like, that's enough. I'm turning up the gas. This is the last of this nonsense that shall ever take place under my roof. I think, Mr. Pooter, that you are rather overstepping. I am the master of this house. Please understand that. <laughs> Dear diary, the fact is, Charles is thinning on top and the spirits looking down would see that. However, Charles's sulk is by no means the worst outcome of the seance. I told Lupin about the word bays being spelled out in conjunction with his name. He laughed, slapped his knee in and declared that the spirit had made up his mind for him. He'd been considering a move to Bayswater to be at a more fashionable address and near to his friends, the Poshes. I fear I have contributed to convincing him to move house. We dine with him at his new address this evening. Champagne straight off, Lupin. A little grand. Now, Gov, I don't want you worrying what is grand here and what is not. I just want you to enjoy yourselves with fellow guests in my new home. Oh, Lupin... Your home will always be Brickfield Terrace, all the way, as long as we are there. Oh, dear boy. A neighbourhood good enough for your parents? Why on earth you'd want to decide to spend almost half your salary to live in Bayswater? I will never... It's own. not a question of Brickfield Terrace being good or bad. I'm not going to rot away my life in the suburbs. Now come through, meet the other diners, and let's enjoy the evening. Love, I know not when or how, only this, only this, that once you loved me. Only this, I love you now, I love you now, I love you now. Bravo, Daisy! You next, the Lily Girl. Oh, I couldn't possibly. Oh, of course you can. You must. I'll sing after a cigarette. The deal is done. <laughs> <laughs> a cigarette. <laughs> Don't you smoke, dear? <laughs> Mrs. Charles Pooter has not arrived as yet. <laughs> Lupin, your father is an absolute brick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Miss Posh. The Lily Girl. Everybody calls me Lily Girl. <clears throat> May I have directions to the water closet, please? Would Mr. Charles Pooter allow me to show Mrs. Charles Pooter to the water closet down the hall? No, I'm sure Mrs. Pooter would be delighted. <laughs> oh, God. oh, an absolute freak! <laughs> Perhaps some fresh air looping once round the garden, Gov? Of course, I could quite easily have visited the water closet without the aid of Lily Posh, but it did give Charles an opportunity to have a quiet word with Lupin. You seem very much at ease in the company of Mr. and Mrs. Posh, despite the fact that you were once engaged to Daisy Nay Muttler. Well, that seems so long ago now. I'm still very fond of Daisy, of course, and I found a great friend in Murray Posh. Trust he's forgiven you over the £600 he lost on Padachica Claudates through your advice. He doesn't give a hoot about that, having made it back many times over. Really? Posh's one-price hat is a household word throughout England. They're opening branch establishments in New York, Sydney and Melbourne and negotiating for Kimberley and Johannesburg. I heard. And he settled £10,000 on his little sister, Lily Girl. My word. Brickfield Terrace, just here, please. Right. It's pleasing to see Lupin in such good spirits and in good company, but... 
Out of reflecting on how his and his friends' fortunes are flourishing as Mr. Perkup's and the firm diminishes. Robin's treachery lies heavy with me. It wasn't deliberate treachery on our son's part, Charles. He gave his best advice. Do you never consider that he could have been right? I don't know anymore, Carrie. I had such a strong knowledge of what was right and wrong, the correct procedures, etiquette, what I consider the standards of the very foundation of society. I fear greatly that as the century changes, the future may become unrecognisable as we know it. Oh, dear Charles. The future will take care of itself as long as there are decent, honest men such as you. And there always will be. There seems to be a carriage outside our home. Mr Charles Pooter. Yes, I'm he. It isn't bad news about Mr Perkup, I hope. I have a note. What is it, Charles? Dear Mr Pooter, come down to the Victoria Hotel without delay. Important, yours truly... Hard for a huddle. At this time of night? Is it too late, driver? Uh, no, sir. My instructions are, if you happen to be out, to wait till you came home and transport you accordingly. Off went Charles into the night, leaving me alone to await whatever might happen next. Pooter, I travel extensively. Meet high-born people and intellectuals frequently, but don't impress easy. Attributes I admire most in a man are honesty... And guts. Though clearly out of your depth at the dinner table the last time we met, you spoke up from the heart. And that impressed me. Thank you, Mr. Huttle. Yeah. Now, I guess you're thinking you've come a long way at a late hour just to be told that. Your message said important, and so... You're confirming another attribute I admire. Loyalty. Though you've only met me once, you came. Good for you. Thank you, Mr. Huttle. Since meeting, being impressed with you and furnished details by Franching, I inquired more and have now read a dossier on Mr. Perkup's firm. A dossier? On Mr. Perkup? Yeah, on okay. behalf of a very rich friend of mine. A pioneer, trailblazer, risk taker, a nation builder, a man totally opposite to you, but a man who needs men like you. And as a consequence of that dossier, he wants to reach out across the vast Atlantic Ocean to you, Charles Pooter. Oh and Mr. Perkup. He wants your firm to be his representative company in England. Possibly the whole of Europe. What do you say? My word. Dear Diary. Such momentous entries to record following events of that most momentous night. Charles said he couldn't speak and then on returning home couldn't stop speaking. And sleep with the excitement of it all and caught the first bus into the city. Mr Perkup, thrilled with the massive injection of new business following Charles's meeting with Hardfur Hartle, asked him if we liked our house and are we happy here. Mr Perkup then said, Mr Pooter. I will purchase the freehold of that house and present it to the most honest and most worthy man it has ever been my lot to meet. <laughs> that, declared Charles, made it the happiest day of his life. And mine. What followed next was truly remarkable and joyous. Engaged, Lupin? To whom? Lily girl, of course. We're to be married in August. I... I thought you still smitten with Daisy Mutler, as was. The way you look bedazzled when she sings. It's true, her voice is beguiling, and Lily Girl has in that talent, but she compensates with the tinkle of her laughter. Where's the gov? Um, I have to be honest, Lupin, and say I, I don't know. And indeed, I did not. As Charles has been spending much time away from Brickfield Terrace of late, in assignations which he has not chosen to share with me. While we wait to tell him my good news, I'll slip round to the grocer's to get two bottles of Jackson Thrust. Better make it four. Going and Cummings aren't far behind me. Four? <laughs> what madness has taken over our lives? Charles, where have you been? Where have you been sneaking away to? And I use the word sneaking after much thought. And wait until Going and Cummings arrive to solve the mystery. Sarah! Yes, sir? Kindly fetch four bottles of Jackson Fur from the grocer, would you please? Yes, sir. 
darling wife Carrie, mm -hmm. my friends Gowing and Cummings, my dear son Lupin, mm -hmm. and ah, oh, sir, uh, do join us, and you may bring a glass. Are you sure, Mr. Pewter, sir? Quite sure. I have an announcement which affects you all. Recently, through business, I have become acquainted with and have been secretly meeting two brothers, George and Whedon Grossmith. Why, Charles? My dear wife, they have the wherewithal to publish my diary, which they find very interesting. Oh, 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 my oh, my oh, I have suggested calling it the Diary of a Nobody. Which they found rather satirical. In episode two of The Diary of a Nobody, Johnny Vegas and Catherine Parkinson played Charles and Carrie Pooter. Lupin was played by Andrew Gower and Sarah by Sinead Matthews. Cummings was Adrian Scarborough and Gowing, Stephen Critchlow. Mrs. James of Sutton was played by Joe Neary and Murray Posh by Joe Ransom. John Garasio was hard for Huttle and Sarah Sweeney played Lily Posh. Other parts were played by members of the company. The Diary of a Nobody is dramatised by Andrew Lynch from the novel by George and Whedon Grossmith. The music was arranged and played by Faze Music. The producer is Sally Harrison and the director is Marilyn Imrie. This is a Woodyback production for BBC Radio 4. Yeah.